best. There we are. Okay, so this is the agenda. Like I said, we're going to get into the human rights space and um, looking at the World Cup. And we are joined today by a very special guest. We are joined by Amina, um, who has done some fantastic work over the years with Sari and more recently as well with Glen Cree uh, Reconciliation Centre. So we are really delighted for Amina to be here uh, and to kind of bring us through kind of her thoughts, her ideas uh, of, of what to do. And then, of course, we'll finish then with a bit of a, a network soapbox that if anyone here would like to share some of the work that they do, uh, they are more than happy to as well. Now, I'm just cautious. I am joined as well by some other members of uh, the Global Youth Work team. So we have Deandra here, who was a former UN youth delegate who's still with us, um, and we're delighted with that. And we also have Aaron, who, who was recently um, he is studying Minute University to become a community youth worker and he's on placement with us um, until February. And um, so you're here with more than just myself here from the National Youth Council. Um, OK, in terms of then um, today's space, of course, then. So, of course, today we want everyone to be mindful. We want ourselves to be mindful um, and we want to kind of, yeah, everyone to be mindful of themselves and for others in the space. And the space is about exploring and sharing. So exploring new ideas, new thoughts, new ways of looking at things. And also it's about sharing. So myself and Amina will share some things with you. And yeah, it's a space for you guys to share as well with the different hats that you're wearing and the different spaces that you operate as well. Of course, it's a network of people. It's about support. It's about kind of supporting each other of navigating some of these issues. And it's about supporting some of, of course, the, the difficulties of working in this way as well. Solidarity, of course, is very important for us and um, solidarity for the people we work with, but also solidarity at a global level um, of the people we don't work with or people we don't have access to uh, and the people um, who are perhaps living a much more complex life um, than we are. And finally, then it is a space for challenge. So it's a space for us to be challenged, for you guys, hopefully to be challenged as well. Um, and really, that's kind of what we see global youth work as well. It's about trying to challenge some of these things that are happening. Um, OK, so a bit about the Learning Network before we get into it. So it was established in 2020 during the whole COVID working online. Um, we committed this year to meeting six times a year, which we've done. And um, this is our fifth out of six. So we've one, one left after um, this meeting. And the space itself, it is for youth workers to engage with professional development, upskilling and exploring global issues. And that's at locally, nationally and a globally level. And it's networking with other global youth work practitioners and organisations who are committed to social justice in Ireland and the world. And it's also a space for communication and informing that development education in the youth sector. And of course, finally, solidarity, the action that we're all here, that we're all fighting for social justice and we're all trying to bring it to some sort of action in our own space as well. OK, so like I said, we like to start off um, these network spaces with a chance to network. So I'm going to put you in, let's say, two um, breakout rooms and I'll give you about 10 minutes or so um, to, yeah, to have a conversation and maybe focus on these kind of questions. Who are we? What do we represent? What are we working on? And maybe what is our focus now in the next six months um, or so? That's, so does that sound good with everyone? OK, cool. OK, brilliant. The, you should be kind of, I'll maybe make three rooms, why not? Um, OK, let's go for it. OK, welcome back to the space, everyone. I hope that was enough time to network, to meet other people. Um, I've been sitting here the last 10 minutes looking at the clock, waiting to get back into it. So uh, welcome back. OK, without any further ado, um, let's get into today's, this morning's conversation. So, Amina, I officially hand over the mic to you. OK, perfect. Um, I didn't... Uh... Get to introduce myself to everyone so i think that's a a nice way um to say hello to those faces that i didn't get to say hello to and to give you a bit of context of why uh why i'm coming to say a bit about the qatar world world cup and um a bit on human human rights so um, my name is amina mustafa i work with sport against racism ireland um, as a board member um and i also run a women's leadership program with glen Cree center for peace and reconciliation um, but primarily my my work with um, Sari has sort of given me a, a bit of 
um, context um, in terms of critically analyzing what's going on in terms of um, the the World Cup, particularly with it just right around the corner. I think the first match is on is on Sunday. Um, but what I what I'd like to do in this session is um, introduce a bit about um, Qatar and the World Cup and what's going on for those that have no interest in sport. Um, but you know, hear or see talks um, or articles about the Qatar World Cup and want to get a better understanding of like what's the big deal, you know, um, and who who's part of the conversation because it seems that there's a lot of people that are part of this conversation. Um, so yeah, that's to to start us off. Um, oh, I I actually don't have control of the the slide. Super, thanks, Leo. Um, so uh, many of us know Qatar um, as a sponsor of their favorite football club, if they're a fan of football, um, such as PSG, Bayern Munich, um, the Barcelona Football Club, um, Roma Football Club. For any of those that um, those football teams sound familiar, uh, Qatar have at some stage sponsored those clubs, um, or you might have just heard of it as the host of the 2022 uh, World Cup. So a bit about Qatar. Qatar is a small peninsula in the Middle East. It's very close, um, bordering Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's in the Gulf region. It's got beautiful beaches, uh, stunning de uh, deserts. And thanks to its natural gas, it's one of the richest countries in the world. Um, in terms of uh, its population, it's home to 350,000 Qataris and more than 2 million migrant workers who play a vital role in, in the economy. Um, just in terms of some of um, the less um, beautiful touristy pitches, um, it, in terms of facts, there are no political parties. Um, just recently, like a few years ago, 2019 was the first um, el um, elective register. So the first time that uh, citizens were able to, to vote for an election, um, which is for a country... Um, like Ireland that's that you wouldn't see that in 2019 um, but yeah it's an interesting fact that's um, quite significant I think as well in terms of uh, considering human rights um, the vast majority of workers can't join trade unions there women face discrimination and homosexuality is criminalized but in terms of the the World Cup um, and some of the facts there in 2010 so a good few years ago FIFA was um, FIFA awarded Qatar the, the ability to be the host of the World Cup um, and so where does the controversy begin so what has gone wrong in the lead up to the World Cup um, and who is responsible so it's been 12 years now um, since Qatar uh, has been the host of the World Cup and um, and for for someone, um, for me initially, it was it was a proud moment because it's the first time that the Middle East has hosted such a um, an event. Um, uh, the Middle East, um, this is the first time that it's really associated as um, a mega sporting event. So it's an opportunity for um, a Middle Eastern country to celebrate its culture um, and not be associated with wars, terrorism, um, and violations. Um, and it's an opportunity, uh, what the World Cup in general for countries is an opportunity for um, uh, to show off what the country's best features are. However, that is often problematic, not just for this World Cup, but previous World Cups where um, the World Cup can be used to frame a country in a certain light and hide other things that are going on, which is is the case for, for this country um, uh, as well. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it isn't really being celebrated. The Middle Eastern country uh, culture isn't the focus of um, this, which I think it shouldn't be because of the various, various um, human rights violations that are going on in the country. Um, so uh, in 2010, when FIFA had awarded Qatar the, um, the ability to host the World Cup, there was a lot of controversy over it due to um, the awareness of the, the human rights violations and um, its record of um, human rights violations consist, uh, persisted. Um, and per around this time, for anybody that um, wasn't uh, aware, FIFA also had an ongoing corruption scandal where it, the executive um, directors um, uh, were under investigation um, 
Uh, so there was uh, a lot of concern around um, uh, world football and corruption at the time. Um, and in, in light of that, FIFA had elected a new president, um, which is Gianni uh, Infantelli, which it should come with a promise of like putting an end to to corruption and like I'm promising to put the FIFA powerhouse uh, in order. Um, however, the uh, Qatar continued to be um, the host of the World Cup. Um, so Leo, if you can pop onto the next slide. Um, so with the the promise of um, the or the ability for FIFA uh, Qatar to host the World Cup. Um, what, what that means is that the country then has to um, build many stadiums, um, hotels, uh, a new airport. Um, so in, in the context of Qatar, there were seven stadiums that had to be built, hotels, an airport and a new city. Um, this is one of the most expensive World Cups to, to date, costing Qatar $229 billion dollars. In contrast to um, the previous World Cup held in Russia, which was um, 11.6, so 229 versus 11, um, uh, which is costing the country a lot of money. Um, but it also means uh, there's a lot of pressure on the country and its construction industry um, and worker or labor um, market uh, to, to be able to construct this new city that needs to be built for the, the World Cup. Um, but also, I think it's important in terms of um, the numbers to consider how much the country is going to make um, during the, the World Cup. It's estimated to be uh, making $11 um, billion uh, for Qatar in revenue. But then I think it's also important to consider how much money FIFA is going to make um, for um, this decision. So they're going to make $11 billion because I think oftentimes when we're talking about the World Cup, we're talking about Qatar um, and there's not much mention of the responsibility of FIFA in, in this context. Um, so all these hotels, stadiums um, and uh, uh, cities that are being built, that's a lot of money. Um, or apart from it being a lot of money, it means that there's a lot of people needed to make it a reality. Um, and this is where the suffering of um, many of the workers that are coming into the country, the two billion workers that I um, mentioned previously that were resident there, um, but also the the um, hundreds of thousands of workers that were recruited specifically to work on um, the the building of these stadiums. Um, this is where the suffering comes in. So as I mentioned, thousands um, and thousands of workers have come in, mainly from Asia and Africa, to do the the hard labor that's needed, um, and um, the um, um, the migrant workers are governed by what's called a kafal system. Um, and for those that don't know, the kafal system is a sponsorship sponsorship system which links um, their um, visa and work um, permit to their employer, um, which is seen as very controversial and because they need a, a sponsor to be able to enter and to work, but also at any reason, or at any point, sorry, um, and for any reason, the sponsor can withdraw a worker's um, sponsorship, leaving the, the migrant worker undocumented and at risk of arrest, which um, creates a power imbalance between the, their employer and um, the migrant worker. But it also means if there's any um, unfair treatment um, by the employer or uh, uh, like undesirable working conditions, the person you go to, you can often complain to your employer. You, you can't really do that because you're at risk of um, losing your 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 um, ability to stay in that country. It also gives the, the employer the freedom to deport you. Um, so these um, are uh, various different um, areas of concern that the Human Rights Watch um, draw attention to in terms of the sponsorship system. So the first one I mentioned there, migrant workers need to have an employer act as a sponsor to be able to enter the country. Um, there's the power um, that employers are given to secure and renew migrant workers' residency permits um, and their ability to cancel them at any time. Um, both these two have actually been um, changed oh, due to the controversy and the criticisms um, in the lead up to the, um, to the World Cup. 
but uh, for a very long time that was was the case. There's also a requirement for migrant workers to obtain um, consent to leave or to change. Um, this has also been changed. Um, however, the other two remain. Um, so employers can report a migrant worker missing, which automatically means that the migrant worker becomes undocumented um, and can be arrested, detained or deported. And then the requirement for migrant workers to leave and exit um, uh, to have an exit permit to be able to leave the country. Um, despite some of the other ones um, being reformed, um, the there remains that the the um, worker needs to have a written letter um, to be able to change jobs. So it, there's still that concern there that the, there's power that the employer has to um, prevent the migrant worker from leaving undesirable working conditions. Um, I could, could you go into the... Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, actually then, sorry. I didn't realize this was the, the yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, the only thing I would say is a caveat to that is that not all migrant workers are being exploited or uh, are experiencing um, these, these situations. Though um, the fact that this system remains means that they're, um, it, it, it leaves it open for employers to be able to exploit the system and facilitates the possibility for abuse um, towards migrant workers. There's also concerns um, around unpaid salaries and uh, non-payment of wages. So I'm just sorry, I'm looking down because I put down a fact that I'd like to throw in there. Um, uh, in 2015, around 30 cases involving Qatar reached the International Chamber of Commerce or um, arbitrary body for non-payment of wages of un, uh, of completed work. So work that's been completed, they still haven't been paid, um, which is, is an area of concern. So these workers often work long um, hours in difficult working conditions. Um, Qatar is based in the Middle East. There's um, high or heat and high humidity. Um, so that's an area of concern for athletes that are coming um, to compete but also for the workers that are putting together the the, the stadiums and um, the city um, and the various other um, infrastructure that's needed for, for this. But it's also a, a concern in terms of their health um, uh, and the, the, the living conditions. Often the migrant workers are living in, live in, um, um, live in um, working situations, which means that the, they're usually small rooms, um, li living with eight to 10 other people, bunk beds. Um, there's opportunity for there to be unsanitary um, conditions. If anybody's reading the news recently, um, there's been reports of um, young, healthy workers um, dying of natural, um, reported natural causes or um, being reported as dying from cardiac arrest, um, which has caused a lot of um, investigation. Can everyone hear Amina or is it, Amina, sorry, your mic's gone. No, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, super. Uh, how long <laughs> have you not been able to hear me? I hope you've been able I'd to I'd say hear me. less than 10 seconds. Oh, okay, grand. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's just covering some of the um, human rights violations towards migrant workers. Um, in terms of uh, discrimination against women, um, uh, piled on or layered on top of the um, kafal system, there's also uh, guardianship, which so their work permit for, for women is often linked to um, their fathers or um, um, brothers uh, in terms of accessing a driver's license, the ability to leave the country um, and various other um, um other freedoms um, when they're in that in that country. Um, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, so there's been a lot of um, public figures that have uh, stepped out um, to um, to speak about their uh, their opposition to uh, Qatar hosting the World Cup or some of the human rights violations. Um, but there's also some very well known figures that are. Um, aren't necessarily doing anything about um, 
the the human rights violation so an example um there's uh, a lot of concern around fans that are going to the world cup that um belong to the lgbt community um because of the criminalization of homosexuality in um qatar despite qatar's authorities mentioned um saying that the um the lgbt community will be welcomed um there is still concerns um around uh, lgbt community that are living in qatar or those that um stay in qatar or if any other um uh if any there's any other issues um, related to their prosecution while they're there the treatment while in prison um uh, is also an area of concern David Beckham has been um, seen as a figure that has um, openly supported um, LGBT um, community. However, his um, recent, well, not recent, but about a year now, signing um, as a Qatar ambassador um, during this World Cup has caused a lot of controversy um, with it, his fan base. Um, one uh, such person that came out is a well-known comedian, Joe Lysett, who um, this article was just published yesterday, actually, um, who s- said he'd tread 10,000 um, pounds if David Beckham didn't um, step out of the deal that he has with Qatar to be an ambassador. Um, so there's a lot of um, high profile names that are um, coming out to to speak up against the human rights violations. Um both when it comes to the um, rights of the LGBT community, rights of women, um, also rights of migrant workers, um, which uh, leads us into talking about um, uh, youth work and, oh, actually, I was going to, sorry, I didn't realise this slide was coming. <laughs> no, but um, I'll, I'll just touch on this, this one and I'll link it to what I was just about to say. So um, uh, human... Um, the, the people that are in the public eye um, and often the young people would have looked up to, um, particularly if they're interested in sport like David Beckham or if they're interested in um, comedy like Joe, Joe, Joe Lysett. This is an opportunity for them to engage in the conversation because they see people that they would um, uh, often uh, be interested in um, or engage with on social media, um, be part of this conversation. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to um, use these these conversations to to start the start the conversation in our youth work spaces. Um, just in terms of um, holding these bodies accountable um, and um, calling into question some of the work that that's been done, um, the FIFA um, in twenty seventeen um, put into place or developed a human rights. Um, policy which was just there on the last slide which gives us an opportunity when we're talking about FIFA and football um, uh, to to hold these people um, or these institutions accountable Um, previously there wasn't uh, before 2017 there wasn't a human rights policy um, um, that FIFA uh, was abiding by but now though it's weekly um, implemented in terms of um, the um, in terms of mega sports events, because we're seeing various um, uh, human rights violations, not just in Qatar, but in previous World Cups. Um, this is our opportunity to, to um, draw on the policies that are developed to say, this is your responsibility. This is um, policy that you've developed um, and uh, an opportunity for us to engage with young people by calling um, in uh, um, by making them familiar with the policies that have been developed. Um, so next, uh, next slide, there, thank you. Um, but in terms of resources as well for, for us as youth workers, um, uh, there's been so many um, reports put out. Even I came across one that was um, uh, developed by a construction company, um, which was called Risk Report. But actually, when you go and read it, a lot of what they've talked about is uh, um, human rights violations, warning companies that are interested in um, uh, doing work with Qatar in the lead up to the um, the World Cup to consider the risks that it, it are associated um, with it in terms of the social impact that it has. Um, but this particular report is one that I would encourage um, youth workers to, to read um, because it touches on 
and breaks down the various different human rights violations um, in the context of Qatar and what has been done about it. So um, over um, time since the uh, announcement of um, Qatar as the host, um, what reforms have have um, been made, but also um, uh, what remains to to be um, uh, changed. Um, so um, that that's one that I would encourage you to to have a look at. Uh, could you um, go on to the next slide, please? Um, and in terms of uh, how we can engage with young people um, on this topic, I would like to um, touch on some stuff that uh, Mamadou Salad is always talking about in his books and in his lectures. Um, I, I recently graduated from a global youth work and development education course, and this is something that was um, reiterated in nearly every class, is meeting young people where they're at. Um, so I, I know there's a great resource out there. It's called um, Qatar 2022, um, Fair or Foul. And it's, um, uh, it's a, a manual for educators to engage with, um, uh, uh, with this topic using various different lessons, um, lesson plans. Um, and it draws on um, geography topics. Um, so looking at maps and um, uh, supporting young people in identifying where Qatar is taking place, where some of the migrant workers are coming from, um, and comparing them to the Irish context. So, um, this particular manual was written by Amnesty International Ireland. Um, so there's resources that they've developed um, for teachers as they framed it. But I, when I had a look, it's um, it's perfect for youth work settings and actually draws on some of the sustainable development goals um, as well. Um, drawing attention to particular human rights um, violations and what I think is so important in terms of making um, it accessible to young people that we're working with is they break down some of the terminology that's used um, in terms of corruption and what's meant by corruption, um, uh, oppression or um, uh, visa issues and understanding what the implications of that um, is on those that are living in the country. Um, uh, I think this is my last slide, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. And I know um, Leo will touch on a bit more in terms of um, the global youth work um, aspect. No, thank you very much, Amina, for giving us yeah, some incredible insight into the region itself, into Qatar, and also bringing in, like I know for ourselves, when we were developing this year's resource, we touched on this and the amount of reports the amount of evidence that is in there over the last 10 years of what has been happening around the building of the stadiums the building of everything and uh, it really is it's it's incredible that that this has all been going on and we're all connected in a way so once again thank you very much amina i, I know amina is not going anywhere and um, but at this stage before we get into more the kind of the global youth work aspect is there any questions at all for amina or is there anything anyone would like to share in the space I guess it's just a, throwing it out there just on regards like our absolutely despicable employment rights worldwide, worldwide, like, you know, the way that we have and how we kind of frame it, that it's not just Qatar that has really abysmal practices as regards human rights. Um, so kind of to widen it out a bit so that it's not like that it's not misinterpreted as isn't Qatar so awful on how they conduct their business. I guess it's just throwing it out there to everybody. There, but thanks, that was amazing. Oh, I mean, it's such good. And like, you know, it's a really, it was really useful to see, like, you know, you kind of know how to point people in the right direction as well when they're bringing it up. So thank you. Um, just, just on that point, there is some great videos on YouTube about previous um, World Cups and uh, how, um, so just coming from like a sports um, sociology um, perspective as well that uh, oftentimes mega sports events for for any sports event um, and any country they often use these um, events to frame their country in a, in a, a certain light but Brazil um, there's a great documentary by um, Vox that's only a few minutes long that I would really encourage people to watch or to their, their young people to, to have a look at talking about how um, in the construction of the stadiums um, they consider transport routes that would um, uh, avoid 
um, passing by slums. There's high walls um, that initially were, uh, when they were being built, were, were um, the justification and prevent noise pollution for. Sorry, Mina, your mic's cutting off again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, super. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, that uh, these high walls, the justification for the the um, construction of the walls was that um, uh, to prevent noise pollution for people that are living um, close to these these um, transport lines. But at one point where there's a new school that's being built, all of a sudden the, the wall becomes transparent to show off this new school that they've built. And then it goes and continues to be a, a high wall that um, uh, uh, blocks off views of, of um, the poverty. Um, uh, so there's there's loads of things that the country does to to hide the issues that it has. And, you know, it, it's understandable that, you know, certain countries don't want other countries to know the the um the struggles that they're having but at the same time it means that when when we're going there we're we're oblivious to the issues that the people that are facing um uh, people are facing that are living in those countries and i was saying this to tilio just before everyone joined that oftentimes it's the people that live in those countries that are paying for the world cup because the the cost of the 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 world cup is being paid by the taxes of the the people that are living in that country and it's tourists come and go but it's the people that are there to stay that have to deal with the the brunt of the cost of, of things like that thank you amina thank you lizzie uh now you have your hand up yeah uh, Sorry, yes yeah. i do i do <laughs> yeah i just wanted to say that for me um to raise those kind of uh, let's say realities is to maybe ask the young people which country do you think is uh, has human rights completely like sorted where the COP should happen. And then maybe some of them could say, let's say Ireland. And then I may ask them then, when was the homosexuality not a crime anymore in Ireland? Let's kind of reflect on that. Mm -hmm. So because sometimes we, we believe, oh, we are the center <laughs> of the universe and we have everything. But the SDGs, if anything, showed us that actually poverty and every ache is happening in every country around the world. So it's has to have that humility as well, uh, while expressing things that are happening in, in the world, maybe even questioning who put those things there and who is saying that these things are right and these things are wrong. Because it's, it's after, uh, after all, we are not feeding uh, a specific uh, um, ideology to young people. What we are doing is actually creating questioning, that, that potential that people could question everything that, that is happening around them. And first of all, for all in their local space as well. So it's always, but it, it's always good. I found it always a very good way to look out there, whatever out there means, and then people seem to always go on that big horse and then say, hold on a second, let's go look in. Mm. And how, and this is how that, this is funny, but this is how globalization could actually teach us about ourselves and be, you know. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nadia. Any other questions at all? Any other comments? Can I ask, do people think that Joe Lysett's kind of narrative that he's putting out there that, oh, I have 10,000 euro or pounds and I have the ability to shred this. Is that narrative, instead of giving that money, if you have it, to human rights defenders or workers' rights associations, I, like what's the point he's trying to make by saying I have the ability to tread £10,000 if David Beckham doesn't pull out? I, I don't get it. Obviously, none of us are going to get it either because we're not in his head. But is that narrative not nearly as, I don't know what word to put on it, as dangerous maybe as David Beckham seemingly going and supporting Qatar in the World Cup? Yeah, I, I remember when I first came across that because I someone had sent it to me and it just happened that 
Um, you know, I, I when they sent it, I said I was going to be talking about the Qatar World Cup the following day. But initially when I saw it, I was actually frustrated because in the article, um, it was saying that um, if he if the David Beckham does pull out a deal, he'll donate the um, £10,000 to um, charities that support um, uh, LGBTQ rights. And I was like, why didn't he just do that in 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 general? You know, um, that I saw it more as a publicity publicity stunt to be like, just so you know, I'm going to be donating, you know, um, and that was an opportunity to draw on the attention of the World Cup to um, uh, to, to let people know that he's donating to charity, you know. Thank you very much. Um, OK, maybe we'll move on to a bit kind of into that kind of global youth. Work. Sorry, Philomena, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was yeah. just wondering, is that even allowed? Is, is it not a crime to destroy um, currency of a country? Is it not a crime? And from so, yeah. Amina's um, presentation, I can see the interconnectedness, you know, between the global south and the global uh, north and south. Just something, an event happening in the east, somewhere in Qatar. Look at the global uh, protracted effect. Workers, you know, they didn't have enough workers, you know, employees to build all the stadium and everything. You have to start getting workers from Africa, from Asia, you know, everybody coming in and look how much expenditure going into this and coming from their own purse. And at the end of the day, like they said, it's money. We used to get more money, you know, because they have the intention of the profits they're going to make. And like Amina said, nobody's talking about FIFA, what their gains are in here, you know. FIFA is not even looking at the human rights violation. They're just looking at the end result how much they're going to get from this, you know? And at the end of the day, if they spend so much, like all these billions, and they get their profit back, are they going to use it to, for the benefits of their citizens? Or is it going to be shared amongst a few? Because I know in my country, it will be shared amongst a few. It will, it will get to maybe produce more facilities like hospitals, roads, and all. When that money comes, it goes to a specific whatever, if there's accountability at all, you know? Mm -hmm. I just saw the interconnectedness, you know? One thing is happening somewhere, it's, it's everybody's business. So it's not one person alone. It's not their problem, it's our problem. Absolutely. Uh, Philomene, I think you've given me the, the perfect stepping stone to where I was going, so I'm delighted you brought up that. Um, chats. Okay, so really, like even as Amina was saying, myself and Amina were talking th this morning about, yeah, fair enough, the, the World Cup is happening in a couple of days, but really the point of this today was that an invitation to start talking about human rights again. Because um, we could be talking about FIFA, we could be talking about the IOC, the Olympic Committee, we could be talking about COP as well that's happening in, in, a, in a controversial country where, where human rights are being violated as well. And really, we would see these opportunities in global youth work as an invitation to talk about something. And a number of you from Nadia and Philomena, you talk about the globalization even of this World Cup. And even if we put that kind of what is sport? What is a World Cup meant to do? What is an Olympics meant to do? And it's meant to be a moment of celebration of different cultures, different countries, the whole idea of sport working together. But when you peel away that, the amount of other parts around that and even the globalization of violations um, seems to be coming true as well. So going into the kind of the, the more kind of theory bits of, of what can we do around global youth work? If we see that this is an invitation to start maybe talking with our young people in our youth spaces about human rights, how do we do it? How do we start even making the connections in our own mind? So the first kind of lens that we have and I know we refer to it an awful lot, but we've never really given an opportunity to even talk about well, what exactly is a human rights lens. So for us, um, a human rights lens represents an orientation to practice. Uh, looking through this lens enables youth workers to see rights rather than needs, right holders rather than charity seekers, and human rights violations rather than individual pathologies. It provides youth workers with a framework of an agreed set of universal principles which can form the basis for dialogue and solidarity between different cultures and faiths, 
In this way, Global Youth Work has that potential to be a useful means of fostering and educating for intercultural understanding and tolerance. Similarly, a human rights lens provides an empowering framework of universal legal rights which can be needed to address issues of inequality which often accompany issues of diversity. So this really is an important lens for a youth worker to try and kind of understand, to try and adapt. Um, like I was saying to Amin at the very beginning before you guys came on is, why does this competition feel like there's a lot more kind of arguments or there's a lot more kind of visual representation? And perhaps is it to do with Islamophobia? Is it to do with that this is happening in the Muslim country? Let's have outrage. Let's talk about human rights now that it's happening in this way. And in order to counteract some of that kind of young people all of a sudden becoming, oh, well, I'm, I'm outraged because this is happening in a Muslim country. Once again, the importance of a human rights lens, the importance that we're talking about human rights here. We're talking about that this happens in all of these competitions, this is happening um, across the world. So for us, a human rights lens, an ideal way for a youth worker to kind of to understand what is going on and how do we navigate this conversation. Uh, Amina, spoke, Amina spoke about kind of, we start where young people are at and absolutely as a global youth workers, uh, as people who work with young people, that's, that's all we do. We have to start there. Uh, and going back to Mamadou's theory of that kind of five faces, uh, and for us, even looking at this World Cup, where does this sit in these five faces uh, with the young people we're at? Uh, of course, we would see it sitting in that culture, that culture of sport, that culture of, yeah, young people, young lads interested in, in kind of the football, wearing the jerseys. A lot of young people, it's their identity as well, uh, that, how much sport and football is part of. But also there's that economic side as well. We're talking about these companies making a lot of money from these World Cups. Um, these companies making an awful lot of profit now over the next couple of weeks where we see advertisements, where we see, Jesus, we'll probably be inundated with FIFA advertisement and the money that kind of falls around that as well. Um, now we can get to that kind of individualistic of, of looking at David Beckham and saying, Jesus, how dare you take that money? Yeah, what about the bigger picture? What about the massive corporations? And I'll get into who exactly who actually is sponsoring this World Cup. And we're probably all connected the same way, David. Now we're probably not making 15 million like David Beckham is making, but we are all connected to it. We're all bought into this. And the young people we work with are connected to this as well. And um, so really, once again, using these five faces to understand where are these connections. And then can we also understand where the actions are then? What are some of the, if we're saying that this is an invitation to discuss how young people are connected to human rights happening in Qatar or human rights happening globally, it's also using these five faces as well. Um, okay, so in terms of how exactly are our young people in our youth spaces connected to this World Cup, you walk into any youth centre probably on this country, and you'll find one of these sitting on a shelf, sitting in a PlayStation, or a couple of young people sitting around the couch playing FIFA. Uh, and really, that's how we are connected. The global connections that young people have through this one game alone uh, is massive. I can imagine there's a whole workshop or potential multiple workshops uh, that could come through um, kind of what young people are engaging with from the different um, sporting icons or gods and um, to the different countries and the different nationalities and the different kind of teams happening in different ways. So young people are connected to this World Cup. Young people are connected to FIFA as an organization and also FIFA as a culture, as a technology side as well. Um, in terms of then, yeah, how are we all connected? How are we? Um, yeah, these are the sponsors at the moment. I don't know if anyone's dropped off, but I'm pretty sure they're still the same ones. So they're looking at Qatar Airways, Qatar Energy, Adidas, um, Coca-Cola, I don't know what Wanda is. We have Hyundai, of course, the cars, uh, and Visa. We're all connected. Every single one of us is connected some way through one of them companies. So that's how we are connected at a global level um, to the World Cup. And then again, if we're looking at our own actions, how do we look beyond? Um, we're not going to shred £10,000, but is there something else here um, that perhaps young people could tap into that we can move towards? So in terms of practical skills or practical, how do I now see what kind of Amina has given us in terms of, of looking at the World Cup moving forwards? There's going to be certain conversations happening, whether it be on social media, whether it be in our youth spaces. And how do we as practitioners 
maybe kind of understand what's going on? How then do we understand of leading a conversation to a certain way, maybe injecting some of these conversations, some of these thoughts into our spaces? So we would see this as being going back to these kind of seven perspective tools that you can use within global youth work. Um, to really understand an issue, to understand what's going on, and, and of course, connecting it to youth work, connecting it to the young people we work with. So the first one we have, of course, is that frame. So thinking about the context, consider what is outside the frame. What do we see? What do others want you to see? And what is not there? And even in that one alone, the amount of different kind of angles we can take in terms of looking at this World Cup, looking at the outrage, looking at some of the responses from some of the celebrities. Uh, we have the glasses then, using multiple perspectives using a different point of view. Can we see through others' eyes? Can we see through the eyes of the migrants um, who have to work? And it's not just um, the building of these stadiums, but it's also the people who are going to be serving drinks at the stadiums, probably um, directing people to their seats. It's throughout this tournament as well that these migrants are going to be involved uh, in this World Cup. So can we see the different perspectives? Can we see the footballers who want to celebrate uh, their nationality and go to this World Cup? Uh, can we see through the eyes of, of the people organising and wanting to share their culture? Can we see through the perspectives then of, of migrant people as well, the LGBT community? Just loads of different perspectives happening uh, in, in this World Cup. And can we use different kind of skills to be able to see it uh, and different methods? We have the satellite then. So kind of what Philomena was saying in terms of that global connection, that global overview. Can we see the world connections? Uh, can we look, look at the worldwide trends and can we use that global perspective as well for young people to see their own connection and to see their own selves um, in, in this competition? And of course, in human rights as well. Uh, what the way we have the weighing scale. So when considering the consequences of an action that may be taken on an issue. So how much will help? How much will harm? Um, and in terms of just looking at these countries, we talked about Brazil, China, Russia, all of these spaces that have had these competitions. How much did it help? How much did it actually harm? Uh, once again, so you can take these at a global level and also at kind of a more of a local personal level as well. You have the microscope. So considering the details of an issue, looking at it closely, zooming in more, basically what we've done this morning, trying to unpack all the different narratives, all the different happenings uh, and how exactly does human rights kind of sit there in the middle and kind of it's all connected to it as well. We have the mirror then, so another, another very powerful one, uh, we're working with young people. So if you could see yourself reacting to an issue, how do you see it affecting you, your thoughts and feelings? What would your action look like to you? Um, if we were all people now living and working in Qatar, what would our thoughts be? If we did have ever be lucky enough to get a World Cup here in Ireland, what would it look like? What kind of violations would come up out of our own country if, if we were to hold this? As Nanny was saying, you'd probably have to go to the moon um, to host the World Cup. There would be no violation, but you can guarantee there would have been to get there in the first place. And finally, then we have the filter. When considering narratives on the issue, we're removing agendas and propaganda, filtering the misinformation and manipulation, which, of course, when we look at these kind of big global kind of capitalist neoliberal happenings, it is littered with propaganda there's different kind of narratives happen and manipulation so we would really see these as such powerful ways um and, and very practical as well of just kind of placing out some conversations that you know maybe you're hosting um the young people one saturday and they're watching the world cup because what's interesting around this world cup is the times are going to suit they're kind of going to be morning and afternoon so they're going to be ideal time for young people probably to watch in your youth spaces um, on their phones. So can we have conversations while it's happening? Can we interject some kind of um, talk or chat around this? Now, not everyone is going to connect to it. Um, and that's the reality. We're going back to, the, we're saying we're starting where young people are at. Um, and unfortunately, not all young people start in that kind of empathy actor space. So this is a reality as well. And it's not just young people. Um, it's lots of people. It's all of us. Um, how do we all feel about this? And um, when we see these kind of, whether it be footballers or media types who will be kind of, whether it be um, talking out against the World Cup or maybe celebrating as well, they all resolve on this kind of global issue spectrum. Uh, and for us doing this type of work, we're trying to once again navigate people from that antagonist and indifferent of not really seeing any connection or not really even seeing that, Jesus, that's got nothing to do with me. How do we move them into a bit more of a 
kind of understanding, feeling, caring and wanting to do something ultimately as well in, in terms of global youth work. So once again, this kind of global issue spectrum becomes apparent. It becomes relevant to, yeah, is there people that don't really care about this, that are happy enough to continue watching this World Cup, not worried about that there is growing questions and, and a, a bigger conversation around human rights? Or is it just about kind of getting that hit of, of just watching the football? So another kind of important tool for youth workers to understand what is the audience? What are the types of young people uh, we are working with? And like we said, by going through with young people, um, by using global youth work, it's about, yeah, an invitation to really kind of have a conversation around human rights while this is happening. Um, so that's kind of really the reason that we thought today, let's, let's go after um, what is coming up in the next two weeks um, and can global youth work um, be a source, be a way uh, of engaging once again human rights. I, I, I always feel that human rights kind of for us kind of sits over there and sometimes we get a chance to look at it, sometimes we get a chance to connect to it. But I think we've come to a space where it can no longer just sit over there on the wall. I think it needs to be a bit more in the forefront. And once again, is this World Cup a nice starting point to do it? Any thoughts, ideas, questions on that? Yeah, um, I was thinking that, uh, you know, connected to this conversation with World Cup and particularly the, the labor laws, the labor uh, rights, I think it's, it's a very interesting point for us to start with the conversation about the rights because, you know, there's an increasing, you know, diminishing of labor rights everywhere and Europe is no exception. So I think uh, particularly when we, when we, you know, we, we think about the kafal system, but like, you know, in, in its own expression, but there are some similarities with what, what happened in, for instance, and it was very visible during the, the pandemic with workers from Eastern European countries that were, you know, sold by, by governments to Western you know, Europe to go to as essential workers for, you know, picking fruits and, and what other, you know, industries that are, were essential. And in all this, uh, you know, what the pandemic revealed in this situation was that it was always, a, you know, you always had some intermediaries that functioned very much like the sponsor. So, you know, in, in the kafal system, so Again, there are specificities and there are expressions, different expressions, but I think it's a it's a great occasion to look <clears throat> at the labor rights in, you know, here in Europe and in connection with this uh, um, Qatar situation. So there are so many conversations that I, there is so much potential starting from here that, you know, I I don't even know like this is the this is the first thought that it's coming or even with the Okay, we have, um, so there is an increasing, <clears throat> when it comes to immigration laws as well, and the access to labor market. What about stamps that we have here? You know, what about the rights uh, of, you know, uh, people seeking asylum until 2019, there was no right for work for people from direct provision. So and again, it changed on the paper, but there is, uh, there is an issue with access. So there are so many similarities and connections that you can start only from looking at Qatar, but actually I think it's important to look like, you know, way beyond that and looking home, looking closer to home. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic. Absolutely, Christina, thank you very much. I think, yeah, that goes kind of back to that kind of plings idea that yeah, how do we even show solidarity to migrant workers in Qatar that face a, a kind of a, a structure or a kind of a violation structure almost with a kafala system and yes yeah, understanding then that is there similar kind of structures happening in Europe and also what about Ireland what about people living in direct provision what about people who have arrived on our shores and they don't have the same rights that that the rest of us have um, and I think that going back to that idea of human rights human rights are only as powerful if people 
claim them, if people own them, if people fight for them, um, I don't think it's something, rights aren't unfortunately going to be just given to us, that people will, will have to fight more for them. Thank you very much, Christina. Philomena, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm trying to look at it from the personal to the local before we connect to the global. Because um, my son asked me a question, I think 2016. I don't know when they did the last World Cup, you know? And he said, mom, why is Ireland coming out of the World Cup so early? And France got to the end and they won the cup. I said, well, I don't know. He said, I didn't see a lot of us with this color in the Irish team, but in France, they have a lot of them, you know? I said, because of their policies and they open their borders or they force their borders, you know, with everybody a long time ago. But in Ireland, Ireland just opened its borders more than two, not more than two decades ago. And my son was born 2001. And I told him, you are the first generation of the African Irish. Maybe in the next two or three World Cups after this, we will be seeing you there. And I look at the World Cup participants for this year, 2022. You opened your borders a long time ago. I work with children of African descent. These are my conversations I'm bringing to this platform. You know, they are so well, they're working so well in sports. You know, sports is another aspect. You know, we can utilize all citizens to bring, bring, their, bring out their potentials and do a lot of things. But in this same 2022 World Cup, I'm not saying maybe 30, 70, you know, I'm just saying almost 90, 10, or almost 100% of Irish footballers. We did something recently with the National Youth Council of Ireland. And um, on my table, I had a lot of uh, Pakistani and all. And one of the young men there, he was about 17 years old. He told me that he's a very good footballer. They call him I don't know that famous Egyptian um, footballer. That's what they call him in school. And all no, of them are no just seller. to that. Yes. And they said, it's not in the school team. The coach did not put him in the school team because it's undocumented or something, but it's very good that he wants to play football, that football is his game. You know, I'm just looking at us wasting talents. So why are we not there? Does it mean that I go to watch football matches a lot? You know, and I see a lot of other uh, cultural, different people, you know, playing good football. But in the national team, we have one set of people. I think yeah. we should start looking from there to encourage us, to make us come together in football and to make sure that when we get the best, we present the best because we are now citizens, you know, and we should, yeah, yeah. the country should represent the citizens they have. That's what I just want to say. Thank you. No, I think, Phil, I mean, I think you, you've raised a very important, I know you said personal, local, but I think you're talking national level as well, like in terms of Ireland's grassroots structures. I think from, from years of the, of the way the FAI, FAI approach football in Ireland, we're, we're, we're so behind, um, even compared to the, the, the very lower leagues of, 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 of England football. We're, we're nowhere near it. And I think that diversity coming through in football has been slowed because of that. Um, same kind of policies, same procedures, the same. I, th I think a lot of it comes down to funding, that even at the grassroots levels, uh, it, it's happening very slowly. Like I, I remember I was asking the same questions a couple of years ago. Of why aren't we seeing more young Nigerian Irish footballers? Because we know now that there should be a cohort of age now getting into the team and it just hadn't happened yet. Um, now, it does seem a lot better in terms of what's on the national teams the way I think they were they were saying this is a bit of a hot take now but in terms of Brexit happening and um, it has actually opened a lot more doors for young Irish players to go to Europe and um, because I know there's an awful lot of um, young Irish players in, in Italy now and um, going through the different schools and academies that will probably give bring them better footballers than they were now they'll come to a point will they rather play for Ireland or would they rather play for Nigeria as well which will I don't know I'd say if you ask a, a footballer who they'd rather play for and um, we're playing for Nigeria would probably give them a better chance to to get to a World Cup than, than playing for Ireland but, but we'll see 
Um, Amina, do you want to come in on anything there in terms of Ireland's structure of football and trying to see a bit more diversity in it? Well, I'm just on that. Um, Sport Ireland recently released their first um, diversity and inclusion policy. So I think that's something that we could use ourselves to um, hold um, like the sports industry in Ireland accountable for, you know, um, pushing for um, active participation and identifying barriers to participation among um, uh, various different community groups. Like I know in um, Sport England, they released a report that looked at socioeconomic barriers for um, various different migrant communities. And it was called, oh no, I the name has gone from my head, but it was 2019 when it was released. And, and it talked about um, uh, stereotypes and the impact that that has on participation patterns um, because there was particular sports that um, uh, people from various different communities were identified as participating and it was like saying that um, the reproduction of stereotypes in certain communities being good at a particular sport versus another sport actually was reproduced in participation patterns um, particularly among young young people that they're encouraged to go in because oh well you should be good at that you know um, and uh, they draw attention to like the concern around reproducing that and how the impact that that has from a young age um, and identifying, you know, actual data that that shows, you know, who is participating in sport. And if there is low numbers of um, uh, sports participation patterns, what could be potential reasons for that? And we don't have any data on that in Ireland. Um, I raised that recently when I saw the r- report um, being produced by Sport England or Sport Ireland. Um, to ask, you know, will there be any monitoring and evaluation? Um, and like, what's that going to look like? Will it be, will there be data? Because I know currently um, there's the Irish Sports Monitor that looks at um, participation patterns, but there isn't really anything around like diversity in, in sport. You know, um, the majority of it would, in terms of diversity, would be how many men versus women, um, you know, um, participate in sport and that's it. And there's no real... Um, uh, diversity in terms of representation um, of identity even you know um, and particularly around gender as well there wasn't a mention of that in sport um, in sports reports where they're actually docu- um, collecting data on um, participation so I think like it sort of starts at grassroots level before we even get to elite sport level you know Thank you very much Amina and, and for Philomena as well for, for the question any other comments or thoughts I know we've thrown an awful lot. We're, we're going down different rabbit holes now in terms of you know, of looking at that kind of sport. Uh, just in terms, I think uh, as well, something that we could draw on is like, you know, responsible um, production and consumption. Um, like doing something uh, around that with young people is uh, would be quite interesting. I know like there's often people looking at the coffee bean and the life cycle of the coffee bean. Well, like it could be the life cycle of your, your FIFA PlayStation game, you know, um, and just thinking about, you know, um, or like your ticket, if you get a ticket to a football match and or you're watching the FIFA mm-hmm. World Cup, like that's a way of linking it in, like this the cycle of, oh, well, you know, they're playing in that stadium. How did that happen? Um, or the um, or just FIFA in general, like where did FIFA get that money from to do this? And, you know, trying to draw a bit more on FIFA's side. So it's not always the focus on the country every time that we're, we're calling into question actions of FIFA. Yeah, I think that's that's very important. Like, I think it's, yeah, not going after the countries, not going after the players and the choices. They're all involved in this FIFA cycle. Um, I suppose they're trying to break anything that's going after the, the, the cycle itself, which is um, FIFA. Um, okay, if there's no other questions, we, we might move to, to a close, um, if that's okay with people, because... Yeah, I think there's an awful lot. I think there's a couple of maybe teams that perhaps we could even maybe do a network meeting on next year. Um, I know some of the bits that Philomena are talking about. Yeah, maybe representation in sport or even sport at a global level um, might be an interesting one as well. But going back to, we have another exciting thing before we even get to the World Cup. Um, we have one World Week, which is, yeah, m- mad in the same way that we have a one World Week and a World Cup happening at the same time. Um, but this is where we are. So on Saturday, we're kicking off. Um, we have ourselves here in Dublin. We're, we're doing a, a global youth summit. 
uh, and Nadia, who's with us this morning. Uh, they are involved in a youth summit also in Cork City. Um, now, unfortunately, they're all sold out in terms of the in-person one. So we have the Global Youth Summit happening on Saturday, and we also have a Climate Justice Conference happening on the Wednesday. Um, but there's still two um, very interesting, very related to what we're talking about today, um, happening online. So on that Tuesday morning, we're looking at kind of that conversation around kind of leaving no one behind and the importance of youth work to that. So that's still open. Um, and we have a fantastic panel um, who will be enjoying this on, on, on Tuesday morning. And then on Thursday afternoon, to close out this um, um, One World Week space this year, uh, we are looking at that kind of idea of unpacking images, stories from the global south. Um, that I know, Christina, are you coming along to that? Um, yes. Yeah, Christina yeah. will be there uh, along with a couple of other people. Um, so we're, we're, once again, we're, we're looking forward to that. So please, if you haven't signed up already, um, please do. Um, we're at that moment now. Oh, yeah, we do have a, a budget, uh, or not a budget, a, a bit of grant money coming through um, that will be launched next week as well. So the One World Week um, Seed Fund grant is back um, and it's being launched next week uh, and in the uh, kind of the idea of running a project from next January to November. Uh, so there's a sum of 400 euro. So if you would like to do something around globalization, around this kind of global workings, um, there is an opportunity there for a, a group of young people or a project um, to do something. Um, yeah, we've talked about that before. In terms of then the community soapbox, is there anyone here this morning who would like to share something that they're doing, they're involved in, or something that's coming up? Uh, now is your chance to do so. Um, just to say, kind of coinciding with One World Week unintentionally, um, Dublin Youth Theatre is going to be um, having our Members One Act Festival, which are plays that are written, um, directed, pr produced and performed all by young people. Um, and it's running from the 22nd to the 26th in the Teachers Club on Parnell Square. Um, performances are at 7.30 and you can find out more on our, our website, which is DublinYouthTheatre.com. Thank and if that. anybody wants to bring a group of like from uh, if you have a group of young people, we do have a group rate um, and and the leaders go free. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Anyone else? Well, maybe just to emphasize there on the event that we are running here in Cork. So we will have from Monday till Friday. So if anybody wants to come along, it's art, it's art for young people. So that will be stencil on Monday. There will be sculpture on Tuesday. Uh, stencil part two on Wednesday, uh, stop motion on Thursday, and memory palace uh, on Friday. So if awesome. anybody knows anybody in Cork who has groups of young people, they should just email me. I will put my email there, and then we put them there. It's a free uh, workshop for all of them. Uh, all the pieces that are, will be created, it's either the young person could keep them or donate them. And uh, we want to do an auction after the event and uh, get the money and give it to uh, some charity, specifically the young people chose to give it to um, homeless uh, shelters and all this and so. Brilliant. Nadia, what's go. your email address? So just for people watching the recording. Yeah, um, oh yeah, so it's Nadia at CDYS. So I'm just Brilliant. going to put it out there as well. So Nadia at CDYS.ie. Awesome. Thank oh. you very much, Nadia. Uh, anyone else? Okay, brilliant. Cool. Um, okay, well, we've won yes, meeting left. About, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. No, go I for it. I just want to talk about Scouting Island and the Irish AIDS um, um, funded project. You know, we're working, <clears throat> we are working with the DEI, Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Unit of the Scouting Island to introduce more on diversity, you know, into the, their program, you know, and we've been doing some, I think they are, um, they are open to, uh, what's it called, recruitment to volunteers now, so they can come in and they get more trainings on diversity, inclusion and um, equality, so they can work, Use it to work to achieve their 2030, you know, 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Philomena. Uh, and we're delighted now you're, you're working with Scout in Ireland. Thank uh, you. We hope Thank to you. work with you more as well. Um, okay, brilliant. We're coming up to near the end, but um, we have, yeah, we've one more meeting um, scheduled for this year. Uh, so on the 6th of December, it's another Tuesday morning online, we're going to be looking at food security, um, obviously from that kind of global context. We're going to be joined by Concern, um, who are going to kind of bring us through uh, the work that they're doing in terms of, of, of working the tr- that kind of food security, insecurity, and also how do we connect it to here in Ireland as well. We're coming up to Christmas, we're coming up into that time where, yeah, the, the kind of have and have nots uh, and kind of food security plays an important role um, around that as well. So we're looking forward to it. Uh, it'll be another interesting kind of very global context. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing you all. Uh, so once again, thank you so much, Amina, for giving us your time and your knowledge um and really yeah we had I, I really i know for myself really enjoyed the conversation and really excited perhaps of where this next kind of bit around human rights can go and um, so no once again thank you thank you very much and thank you to everyone else as well for for giving us your time and coming along um to this network if, okay, if anybody awesome. has any questions about any of it i threw my email in um the chat there cheers amina thank you all very much see you all soon Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.